Well, that's all right. Listen, I am so excited to have y'all here tonight because this is actually the second conference for persecution. Okay, the first one we did the other day, and they talked about their various understandings of what's happening today. And you two bring a very unique perspective uh, to the subject of persecution because of your um, exposure to the subject of Israel, the Noahide laws, the governmental realm. And so tonight, I would love for you to talk to us a little bit about uh, how do you define persecution? Like, if you could just talk to the church, we have a lot of new Christians, which, which by the way, Stephen, I just want to tell you that when you preached the other day, we have received so many compliments, sir, about your preaching, and a gentleman got saved. I just want to share a quick story. He was mowing his grass listening to you he has a lawn care business in uh south carolina and he was mowing his grass and when we all stood there and prayed there at the end he got off his motor his uh lawnmower and began weeping and then he got filled with the holy ghost right there and began speaking in tongues and he was just weeping just listening to you wow. so i just want to tell you that uh you're such a blessing to the body of christ and we very much respect, you know, what God is saying through you and what you understand as persecution. So to this gentleman that is new in the kingdom that does not understand, you know, what the big picture of what's happening right now, can you explain to people what is persecution? Well, we're already starting to see the beginning of that uh, persecution uh, with, with, with as simple as the fact of this coronavirus uh, pandemic, uh, yeah. it definitely was planned, but the, the mere fact of putting on these face masks every day when they're totally suppressing the immune system of, of human beings. And so right. this, is, this is just one phase, of course, of that persecution. But now, that's not necessarily targeted towards believers uh, and, and something like that, because I guess we're looking at more of what are Christians going to be going through. But the coronavirus, though, their their pandemic does include targeting Christians. Like, for example, they're blaming the churches uh, for spreading the virus. Uh, they're saying that we're the big cause of it. When most churches are, you know, in my opinion, have gone against the word of God and totally uh, being complicit with their orders that they have they put out there. It's very few churches that have not, uh, you know, complied with government orders. Uh, but nonetheless, they're targeting Christians, and it's it's a form of persecution in saying that you know you have to social distance. You're not allowed to. Uh, uh, to to go to church services, right, right. There is just a few people. Uh, these are just subtle persecutions as of right now. But what's coming though is going to be far worse. Uh, and you know, of course, you know when we look at this one, let me pull up a scripture for this as well, because one of the one of the first things that caught my attention. Uh, about uh, the the this order they were doing with the churches was the scripture about uh, forsaking the assembly, okay, not to forsake the assembly, and right. uh, but it's it's deeper than just what most people think about, and uh, so I'm trying to find where that's at. I know it's in Hebrews, if I'm not mistaking. Uh, so let me just find that real quick here. <clears throat> yeah, Hebrews 13. And uh, in Hebrews 13, we read, uh, verse 5, let your conversation be without covetousness and, and yes. content with such things as you have. Uh, no, 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 that's not the one. That's not the one. I apologize. Uh, uh, not to forsake the assembly together, especially when you know that the day is coming or drawing near. Yes, right, right. Commandment from, from the Lord not to forsake our assembly. But yet when this COVID-19 um, regulations came in, this was the first thing. Churches had to forsake their assembly, right? They had right. to change the 
uh, the right to assemble for this fake safety, supposedly to save lives from COVID. Yeah. This is a form of persecution. So we know that this COVID or coronavirus yes, is yes. ultimately leading us to the persecution of Christians. And ultimately it is to wipe out Christianity altogether, replace it with one world uh, religion that they're forming yes. right now. And, um, I mean, I am, I am going to say here something that it's, it's okay. It's not easy to say because I have to name names and I, I really didn't want to do that. But there is in a church a takeover and it has been happening for a very long time. This is this Hebrew roots movement, kind of a return to the law, you know. Yes. Talk to us, Yana. Come yeah, that, on now. That focus on Old Testament and, and the return to the right. law. And there is a name, Mark Biltz. And I am sorry to name the uh, actual name. I didn't mean to do that, but I cannot just, uh, you know, not to mention this. Mark Biltz was hosting Messianic Rabbi Isaac Shapira in his uh, church or in his assembly for several years now. Itzhak Shapira comes into the church preaching as a Jew believing in Jesus, okay? But he's started warning Christians that last year all over the place, he was touring United States, cities, and Europe, South America, right? South Africa, I think as well and he was saying the church as an entity will soon not exist now mm. at the time at the time we were like shocked to hear this yeah and this is what's been spread out what does he mean church as an entity will soon not exist right what, what does he know we don't know you know at the time it was it exactly was uh -huh. yes ma'am but now the corona comes and of course, they close the churches. Wow. Right? And there is this attack on church. And now they, the, the same group is preparing this revival, okay? This revival for the false Messiah. And they were preaching to the church that they need to come underneath of Jewish rabbis, under the wing of their teachings, they need to return to the Old Testament mm -hmm. and then they need to start studying Talmud and believe or not, you might not have heard of this. And I don't know if you did June or not, but this is a huge, huge movement yes. among Christians and they're taking a lot of Christians onto their sides and these yes. Christians attaching themselves to the Jews and they are listening to the Jewish interpretation. I, I would love to talk about this a minute if y'all don't mind, because I just wrote those books where I address this very subject. And the reason is, is because to me, I just told my friends this morning at my good morning on the farm, I talked to them about it because when they do that because what happened is is the new apostolic reformation has infiltrated all of our churches just about and brought in these rabbis to begin to pull everybody back to the hebrew roots but what they have done is they have basically hung jesus on the cross again yes. they hung him on the cross again because he is the lamb that was slain he yeah. is the he came to deliver us from uh, the law. We could not live under the law. Why would we want to go back? This is why God, I mean, Stephen, I know that you're a Jew and you understand a lot more about this than I do, but my understanding is it is that Jesus came to give us grace. He came to give us freedom, not the grace that's been misused, but, you know, the grace to where he is the lamb that was slain and he is the mediator between us and God. And see what they want to do, which is a part of the new world order, is they want to do away with that mediator. And this is why they call us anti-Semite, 
-hmm. because they're saying that we, they think that we're better than them because we have this only way to heaven, that Jesus is the block between them and God. You see what I mean? Yeah. Well, he was the lamb that was slain. He's the reason that we have access to God. And nobody in the kingdom is better than anybody else. And if there are any Jews watching, it's not that Christians believe they're better than anyone else. It's just that they accept that Jesus was the lamb that was slain. They, slain. they accept the price that he did. And they recognize that he alone is the door. He's the only way to heaven. So what they have done, Miss Yana, is they have taken the church. They have pulled them back. And this is what I would love for y'all to address because they just had the march on Saturday about morality. And they're saying they're doing the march on morality because they're coming after the white evangelicals, which I've been telling the church is just coming after Christianity. So they're using morality as a way to pull everybody together, saying that we basically have the wrong morality because we oppress people based upon you know, the Lord's uh, rules, I feel. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Am I making sense, Stephen? Please fill in the beast. Uh, let me back up just a little bit because when you were talking okay. about Christ as a sacrifice, uh, this is why I wanted to bring up the not forsaking of the assembly. There's a lot okay. of people don't understand about that particular um, uh, passage. And it says here in Hebrews 10, 25, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as a manner of some, uh, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. But it's yes, important to yes. read the next verse, though. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for right, sin. Exactly, right, exactly, yes. But here's what people are not recognizing. Hebrews 10, 25, and the forsaking the assembly is a prophecy. It's not just a saying, uh, you know, oh, you shouldn't be forsaking the assembly. Right. Whether the writer of Hebrews knew what was going to happen in our day or not when he wrote it, I can't say. But clearly God knew what was going to happen, so he had him write it. So if you go back and look at it in this slide here, we're thinking of it prophetically. Now look at what it says. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much so more as you see the day approaching. Yeah. All right, the day approaching. Then what does he say? For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, Christ was the truth. So, all right, that's a yes. best sense, right? So if we sin willfully after we receive the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. What does it mean by 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 that statement, if you sin willfully, the knowledge of the truth is that Jesus Christ was the sacrifice for your sins. So in order for you to sin willfully, you must reject the message of Christ, go underneath a bunch of Talmudic rabbis, build a third temple, re-offer sacrifices again. Right. And you have now rejected the truth, and that is why you no longer have Christ as your sacrifice. But, as he says in verse 27, a fearful looking for of judgment and a fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. So now we know by verse 27 that the judgment of God that brings fire upon the earth is the time frame in which verse 25 is set in. So if we know that when Christ returns, he's coming to burn this world off and the devils that have overthrown everything, then we go back to verse 25 and we look at the forsaking, not the assembling of yourselves together. And you must conclude that that was a prophecy of the day that we're living in, right? Exactly. That's right. Amen. Yes. Amen. Now, I would like for you, there's, I see people in the chat that, are talking about the Noahide laws. And uh, you brought up a very good point to me yesterday, Miss Yana, when we was talking about everything happening. You, made, you brought up the point about they are actually preparing everyone for the Noahide laws, and they're using the term of morality. Now, yeah. can you explain what you mean by that? Yes. Now, um, Noahide laws 
are in United States law system. It's a public law 10214. It's under Education Day USA, and it always is celebrated uh, when Schneerson, which was a Chabad leader, Schneerson has his birthday on a Hebrew calendar. Schneerson as a rabbi. Now you have to understand the difference between a rabbi and a rabbi or a rabbi. Yeah. When, what when, is it? Right. When Jews call a man rabbi, he is even higher than a rabbi. He's from what? A, he's from a dynasty. See, he's from a certain dynasty of wow. rabbi. Meaning that they're really a very high ranking. Uh, kind of like Kabbalah. <laughs> yeah, they're Kabbalists. They, they, they do the secret Kabbalah. Okay. And they truly, and he truly was a very influential, almost like um, not from this world type of influential he was, leader. He was believed to be the Messiah. Yeah, he was. Uh, exactly. And up until even when what? he died. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. This is the, he's the leader of the Chabad organization. Yes. Oh, I know who he is, okay. but I didn't know they considered him as a Messiah. Oh, if you go to Israel, you will see his poster plastered on every single bus stop. Wow. In all of Israel. And in and New York as well. Now, in New York, because wow. yes, and you know that uh, uh, Jared Kushner and Ivanka Kushner are part of exactly that sect of Lubavitcher yes. Rebbe, uh, Judaism, and they it's pray a, to him, right? And they pray to yes. him, you know, how yeah, are you familiar with the fact how they went to his grave? His grave is in New York. He, they went to his grave the night before elections and they were praying, I heard about this. They were praying to the dead rabbi, okay, for the blessing of Donald Trump, Trump and so that Trump can win the election. Well, right, so well, you do realize since we brought Trump into this, you do realize there is a huge connection of President Trump and the Chabad. Chabad, yes. I know. Chabad, because First of all, his father, Fred, gave millions of dollars yes. to their temple or synagogue there in New York. Yes. So he was a great funder. Of course, he did real estate. So yes. he's a great funder of it. And then it just so happens that Ivanka uh, left her Christian roots and came over and converted right. to his religion when they got married. So it was a very, you know, serious thing and very serious ties that they have uh, to the Chabad. And now what I've noticed just from being a White House correspondent through my research for the books is the connection. And maybe, Stephen, you can put some of the connections together. But the connection between, OK, you take President Trump and you take Netanyahu. President Trump is attached to the alt-right in the United States, which is the new apostolic reformation. Then you have Netanyahu, who is attached to the far, you know, the far right, which is the Orthodox Jews, right? Right. Okay, so they're both connected to the far right. And it just so happens that while they're connected, that Trump's first three and a half years, both of them are assaulted by their governments the same. Both of them are falsely accused. Both of them are going through great attacks. Both of them, I mean, the same type of scenario on both sides. Okay, then you find the connection of Trump doing kind of the, the strong arm for Netanyahu. Is, I'm just telling you what I see. He's like the strong arm, like he is the one that put the rule down that Jerusalem is the capital. Okay, so they go over there and then they move their embassy over there to Jerusalem. They do this big deal. Trump gets his son-in-law, the one that is Chabad. Chabad. How do you say that? Chabad. Chabad. Say Chabad. You say it like a K instead of trying to do the Hebrew guttural in there. Just do it like Chabad. That's close enough. 
Thank you. Okay. Okay, because I definitely. Chabad. Okay. It's like a KH. Okay, KH. Chabad. Okay. All right. So you take when Trump got in office, he put uh, him and Ivanka over the peace plan. Mainly it was Jared. But he put him over the peace plan. And you got to think of this like, how odd is that? Because he's not a representative of the government. He's not appointed. He's not voted. He's not placed into that position to be able to go to a foreign country and to speak on behalf of our government. I know. He is, he is only a family member. Okay. Well, that's the question. That's right. Why? That's right. You don't. Yeah. So he that. goes over there and he he makes deals. You know, shakes all these deals across the entire planet over this peace deal. Okay. Then we discover that both sides, even though they're connected to the alt right, which you know are the ones that would speak up against this new world order formation, even though they're connected to them. They are still on the board at the UN, the main, you know, satanic organization. They are on the board of the LGBTI implementation plan of the SDGs, which is their Agenda 2030 plan. So it's like, how can you be partnering with the right and saying that you want to do everything that is right, but you're partnering with perversion? And then even we talked about this the other day, Stephen, how, you know, in Israel is the capital of the world for perversion. Right. The LGBT capital is there in, in Israel. Okay, yeah. so now time has rolled around. Now we have this big deal. And now we see the fruits of it all. They have come together under the guise of the New World Order and the uh, World Economic Forum which is the beast. It's the brain of the beast. And they both work together with them for this economy across the world. Do you see what I mean, Steve? Can you add anything yes. to this? Yes. Okay. okay. Now, you know today, or no, actually on June 22nd, maybe you already brought this up, uh, the, the president actually backed Netanyahu uh, on the... Uh, the peace plan to move forward to annex uh, the, the West Bank. Yes, I did in July. Yes, I heard about this. All right, yes. all right. So we'll skip that for, for now then. Now, when you talk about the connections, uh, it's very important to understand those connections. And it's not just the Orthodox community that Netanyahu is attached to, but rather he is attached specifically to the Chabad organization to start exactly. with. Exactly. Uh, he had met multiple times with Schneerson. Uh, and, and two, there's a lot more to, to, to knowing about this and what people realize. Uh, Netanyahu, he was educated in the United States, and uh, he had gotten his, his degrees uh, in the United States uh, and was, had an, an incredibly good job making six figures, uh, mm -hmm. but for some strange reason, uh, after even meeting with uh, Schneerson, he goes back to Israel, takes a job working in a furniture store, making $8 an hour. From six figures, he leaves, uh, leaves his wealthy job, goes to Israel after meeting with Schneerson, goes to Israel, works in a furniture store for $8 an hour. Then we have Mike Evans comes along, uh, and this is when uh, uh, Prime Minister Begin was Prime Minister of Israel. And we hear this famous story told about uh, that, uh, that he goes over there and it was right around the death of uh, Jonathan Netanyahu, which was Benjamin's brother, that we get this story uh, that, that uh, Mike Evans uh, puts out there that, that he was, in, he was, of course, Mike Evans was a journalist uh, and, his, and his correspondent uh, in Israel. Uh, covering the things that happened there. He flies over right. there, and he's there during the time of the death of Netanyahu. He tells this fancy story about how that God led him to the Netanyahu's house. Uh, he anoints Netanyahu with oil. Supposedly, he's a stranger to them and prophesies over him that he'll be prime minister over Israel, not once, but twice. Wow. Uh, I used to think this was a very bona fide, real story, 
uh, until I began to really find out the true makings and behind the scenes of what was going on. And of course, he, he originally goes there claiming that he went there because God sent him there to build bridges between Israel and the United States. He meets with Begin, uh, or excuse me, Menachem uh, Begin, and, and while he's there, uh, he says to him, uh, he, gets an, he gets an interview with the prime minister. He says, well, why are you here? And he, of course, he's claiming, he says, I have no idea yet. Uh, he said, you know, so he comes back later and he said, that's when God tells him they're going to build bridges. But in the meantime, he also tells uh, Menachem Begin that he met this young man named Benjamin Netanyahu uh, and that he should find a place for him in the government. Uh, and, mm. and uh, uh, Menachem Begin puts Netanyahu in the government. I'm leaving a lot of details out because I don't want to bore everybody with this long story about this. Uh, but, but Netanyahu then ends up in the cabinet of Menachem Begin. And the, the reason why they did all this, though, what people didn't know about, is Menachem Begin was the first prime minister of Israel that Israel had that was not in their pocket. Now, he wasn't a good man, but he wasn't in the pocket of the yeah. elite, and they needed to break it, and so they were looking for a way to do it. And not only that, though, they were grooming Netanyahu to be the prime minister of Israel in the future. And what I did not know at the time was how in bed Mike Evans, that's just a cliche, uh, yeah. in bed with the Vatican he was. I did mm. not realize how closely he was working with the Vatican. So there was a much bigger sinister plan and the Chabad yeah. organization and the Catholic Church were all working together and Netanyahu was going to be their man to make it happen. And in that meeting that he had, one of the meetings that's recorded that he had with uh, uh, with uh, Rabbi uh, Menachem Schneerson, he says, he asked him the question, what, because at this time he's only now representing Israel under Begin. So he asked him, he says, what are you doing to bring the coming of the Messiah? And uh, Netanyahu says, well, I'm doing all, the, or we're doing all that we can. We are doing all that wow. we can. Wow. He says, well, you're not doing enough. You need to do more. Now you have to understand why uh, Schneerson says this. All right, because in the Chabad group there, they're very much like the uh, Frankist uh, doctrine in Judaism, which believes that you've got to do some really bad things on the earth in order to get the Messiah to come. So when he's saying, mm. to him, what are you doing to bring the coming of the Messiah? That's what he was actually doing. He was trying to, to he, they're, they're, in other words, okay, everything you can do bad, all right? Blow up this country, blow up that country, whatever we got to do. But what is it? This is, it's, it's kind of like a compound prophecy when we look at uh, uh, over in the book of Daniel 11, where he says, uh, and the violent, the angel Gabriel speaking to Gabriel, and he says, the violent among your people will try to establish the vision. Now, actually the prophecy, and I've never said this before in public, that prophecy was actually fulfilled 2000 years ago when the Maccabees overthrew the, the, the Zadok priesthood in Israel, and they came in to try to bring their own Messiah through violence. Mm. Later in the Talmud, it was written that it was Jesus was the violent and his apostles were the violent that were trying to establish the vision. Wow. Yeah. But in modern days, in modern days, like a cyclical event, again, this Rothschild Rockefeller creation of the state of Israel, right. uh, they, they are trying by violence to bring in prophecy, to bring the coming of the Messiah. The only difference is, is now they're taking the Christians that have been believing Jesus Christ to be the Messiah all their life, and they're trying to drag them back oh, in. Oh, no, it's so sad. Right? So I know it's a long way around to get around to that answer, but that's the connection that we see with Netanyahu. Netanyahu is connected to the Chabad organization. The Chabad organization is connected to the government of Israel. They're to bring about the Noahide laws. He is also the charismatic leader that brings in the evangelicals. Mm -hmm. and was one of those leaders that they were using to connect the evangelical groups. Yes with the Jews, and of course Netanyahu is the go-between that connects as, as more of a secular believer, even though he's orthodox, he's a se he looks secular, because you have to understand in the Chabad, not everybody in the Chabad runs around with the black shirt, black or black 
clothes and a white shirt and black pants. Most of them are doctors and lawyers that walk around every oh, day. Oh, wow. Nobody yeah. sees them, right? So, so that's what Netanyahu is. He is a Chabad uh, Jew, but he is able to be the businessman. And then he brings in that evangelical movement and then they hook them in and they bring the fish in. Also, of course, the Vatican working with them. They groom the Pope of Rome. The Pope of Rome yes. was groomed by the Orthodox community back when mm -hmm. he was still an archbishop in South America. So this yeah. whole thing has been groomed together. I mean, Lori Cadoza Moore, you know, she came to me and told me, keep your mouth shut when it comes to the covenant that we're working with between the Vatican and Israel. Right? Why? Because they were bringing that alliance together. Okay? So these are all these well-known evangelicals that are working to bring Christians underneath First, they bring them under the Vatican. Then they bring them underneath uh, their, their, their yeah, the Talmudic rabbis. And then those Talmudic rabbis will bring them to the Antichrist. So right. that's the connection. That's what Netanyahu is for. And this is why he's not out of office either. Well, the thing is, is, I don't think a lot of people understand the, the way that they use uh, the evangelicals that they have partnered with i was trying to explain this to the bride today but they use them to talk the language of the church because if a jew you know from the culture of judaism tries to talk to an evangelical and they don't know how we talk we wouldn't understand the, the his terminologies That's right. but if if the evangelicals sit down with them and say look you need to say words like anointing you need to say the presence of God. You need to say, you know, and they, I'm sure they sit them down and tell them, this is how you're going to woo the evangelicals back over to your side. Is the only way I can describe how they're doing it because a good example is Breaking Israel News. Yeah. Breaking Israel News is an organization that is, I call them a front. They're like an infiltration. Yeah, uh, can you agree with that? Is my assessment right? Yes, yes, You're yes. You're correct on that. Okay, I now they're the ones that have made the Israeli Bible, the Israeli Bible, the Israel 365 Bible, okay, which is talking. They're really they're selling this to all the evangelicals, and they're 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 trying to talk. Go ahead. This is the Bible that they're pushing on evangelicals right now, and this okay. Bible in it all explanations within with jewish lenses meaning all it's of got the, talmudic yeah uh, all of the prophecies and everything right here as you read the bible down here are the explanations by the jewish rabbis through jewish talmudic lens wow so yeah so they're basically and and i don't know i didn't know we're going to talk about this on certain page here they actually explain noahide laws yes and they don't buy the Noahide bible laws. don't buy it so basically this is what they're doing they're judaizing yes christianity. so yes they are right they're judaizing christianity and let me go back june into i started speaking about schneerson and the public wall one of yes uh -huh, yes ma'am Okay, and we said that Schneerson was a leader of Chabad and he was considered the Messiah. And a lot of people, uh, a lot of Jewish people think he's still the Messiah and he's going to resurrect, okay, or in, in reincarnate because Jews believe in reincarnation. That's their. Wow. Life. That's right. Now, Schneerson wrote several documents and books, and they were always in Hebrew uh, up till. 1960s i believe nobody knew really from english speakers what his books are about but then comes an israeli jew by name uh israel shahak that's his name israel shahak and he was a professor at the hebrew university he was a scientist he taught chemistry and he decided to translate schneerson's uh, books and and, yeah. let, and let the americans know what schneerson uh wrote right because not many people speak hebrew in united yeah. so schneerson's books reveal that he was teaching that gentiles are animals 
that are not human species. That are lower mm. subhuman species. Okay. He also was teaching that Gentile souls came from say, three satanic spheres, and he was teaching that Jewish souls are divine. Okay. So he brought in the Noahide laws, which are spelled out specifically in Talmud, in the book of Sanhedrin, in Talmud. Right. Noahide laws. And he, he was making these Noahide laws. He brought them up even in a Jewish community. And he started educating even the rabbis in synagogues that they need to go forth. He was, he was training them and educating them. They need to go forth and start pushing Noahide laws and teaching Noahide laws, the Jews, so they can teach Noahide laws, the Gentiles. And, and yeah, Schneerson with almost like a supernatural charisma, you know, from satanic uh, powers. He, yes, got, ma'am. he got through the government and he got through many governments. He started building Chabad houses of all over the world. They have them mm. all over the world. Wherever you go, right. in any location on our planet, you will find a Chabad house. Okay, and, and they started educating their Chabad people about Noahide laws and then infiltrating governments of a specific countries and then pushing these governments to sign Noahide laws into, in, into their law system. They were very successful in the United States, okay? And, and all okay. presidents, beginning of Carter, every single president have signed Noahide laws on Schneerson's birthday, including Donald Trump, including yeah. during these lockdowns on April 3rd, I believe, 2020, they resigned them every single year. Now, the march, that, is it about to happen or they just marched? What's about the They brown? just marched last weekend. Okay. Now, the Noahide laws, if you listen to rabbis that promoted, they call them uh, laws for peace and security. These are laws for peace and safety. Mm. There are plans to make these Noahide laws as a part of international order, international law. This is what they're planning. Mm. Uh, they also, uh, Rabbi Cohen has an NGO and he has office in the United Nations where he promotes Noahide laws. And he does a lot of speeches. In fact, if we could get into my email and I could pull it up, I wanted you, June, to listen to this speech because you will immediately recognize what he's talking about. But they're trying to make this as a um, international law that will be above any, any law of the country, meaning that with, even within our own law system, as in the United States or in any country, you're going to have to submit yourself to the Noahide laws because they will be basically considered international law. Mm. And well, don't they have all of these centers all over the world? Are they called like Shabbat centers or whatever? Yeah, yes, but they are actually uh, promoting Noahide laws in the name of uh, morality, okay? And uh, the, the seven Noahide laws, when you start reading the sub-laws of seven Noahide laws, you will start finding out how, uh, how uh, racist and supremacist these laws are. For example, when, when you sign Noahide laws, you, it's like signing a blank piece of paper, Jim, and you put your name here, and yeah. these rabbis are making up their own sub laws and they're writing them in as they go. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then our presidents just resign them every single year. So, yeah. let me talk to you about sub law. On the Noahide laws, there is a sub-law about theft, okay? In a Talmud, Talmud teaches that Jews own everything, every property, and then they are allowed to steal from a Gentile. However, Gentile cannot steal from a Jew. Right. So under Noahide laws, they are saying that violation of any of the Noahide laws is decapitation. 
any seven mm -hmm. violate, you, you must be decapitated. Now, but it sounds a lot like the Muslims, too. Oh, absolutely. In you fact, know, the same type of principle. Absolutely. Nahid law and Sharia law have a lot in common. Yes. And in fact, they're going to be uh, using uh, maybe Muslims for decapitating because they made agreements. Wow. The, the Noahide uh, rabbis may, made agreements with Muslims. The wow. Noahide and Sharia laws are synonymous. Wow. Yes. But anyway, let me go back to the sub -law so you understand. Yes. So you understand how horrible the sub -laws are. Let's say one of the Noahide uh, laws says do not steal. Sounds great, doesn't it? It sounds perfect. No, right. We shouldn't say do not steal. So, <laughs> right. and right. do, so fine, we have something in common. Yay, we are <laughs> Christians. No, uh -huh. I are great. We say don't steal, Jews say don't steal, we are friends, right? Yeah. Okay. Except, except when you go into the details of sub laws and you start reading it and you start understanding that if any Gentiles, Gentile steals, anything in the amount worthy of one cent do you hear me one cent wow that's enough value of a one cent it's enough to be decapitated yes so imagine the supremacy of these laws mm -hmm. you stole one little copper cent yeah you can be decapitated because you are a Gentile. Mm -hmm. Now, and, and listen, uh, Gentiles under Noahide laws can be executed just on a base of one witness. The Jews need two or three witnesses mm -hmm. according to the Old Testament law, not a Gentile. One witness is enough. Okay? Uh, they can be decapitated based on accusation of one witness and then mm -hmm. can be even your own family yeah member, even your own family member however when it's about the jewish law they will not take more they have to have two or three witnesses okay and then they cannot have anybody from their own family against them right so do you see the inequality yes do you see the supremacy here oh yes okay what is the the biggest danger i would say for the christians under noahide laws and signing of unconstitutional noahide laws like you see that president trump if he truly was a christian if he truly was a christian and meant well for christians yeah he could, he could never sign noahide laws understanding what they stand for exactly do you understand? He would protect yes. Christians. He would say, no, we got to get Noahide laws out of White House. Right. I'm not signing them because I'm a Christian. Right. But just the mere fact that he's signing them with the 10 Chabad rabbis mm -hmm. around every single year tells you he's he is a deceiver and a yeah. wolf. Okay. Now, under Noahide laws, it says no idolatry. That's the first law, no idolatry. Again, it sounds great because Christians don't believe in idolatry. So it seems like everything is hanky-dory and happy, right? Now we are right. the Christians. Again, you go into these little sub-laws and explanations and under Noahide laws, the worship of Jesus as God is considered idolatry. Exactly, and that's gonna be a decapitation. That's exactly right. That's right, which when you brought that up, Miss Jenna, about President Trump with the signing off on the Noahide laws and why it is the Christian, what I wanna know, okay, being an evangelical, is where are the Christians? Why are they not standing up when he goes and signs it? Not only that, but when he does the anti-Semitism. And he does that, not considering what about what are you signing for the evangelicals? Right. I mean, where's the protection of Christians? Exactly. You know? Exactly. I, I, I know what you're saying, definitely. 
Well, you have to reverse it. Imagine that if Christians were putting some laws on Jews, okay, that we would be demanding of Jews certain laws under which, under our interpretation, Jews could be decapitated. Right. My goodness, that would be like the end of the world. That would be a, what an anti-Semites and what right. racism yes, on top of that. Holocaust, right? But look what they're doing to Christians. Yes. They're signing laws that seem on the outside as good laws, you know, because everybody says, well, what's wrong with Noahide law? Mm -hmm. Do not murder, do not steal, yes. do not commit adultery. And we're gonna talk about this, do not commit adultery. You will be very surprised what Talmud teaches and what Talmud allow, uh, allows under Noahide laws. You will not believe this. Stephen will explain this to you, okay? But on the outside, it looks beautiful. Right, mm -hmm. we can all agree, right? We have one, yes, ma'am. No blasphemy. One of yes. the high laws is do not eat limb of a live animal, okay? Mm. So it says do not harm the animals, right? I, right, you have to humanly kill them and then you can eat them. So, you know, we agree it's all nice, but then you go to interpretations of these laws under the Noahide sublaws and how Jews interpret them. And then one, the seventh Noahide law says that Gentiles are obligated to create courts of justice. Yes, I was going to ask you about that to explain that as well. They're already setting those up. Right. As, you know how Trump appointed how many right-wing judges? Has it done a lick of good? Right, well, 143 are of them, but now mm. all of these judges are uh, trained in Talmudic laws. They are, wow. Yes, in fact, the entire justice system is trained in Talmudic law. Wow. And, uh, exactly. So, um, yeah, in fact, there was a, a Jewish group, I think their last name is Lewis, the, 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 law group i think that were pushing uh, decapitation as a humane form of uh, execution mm -hmm. right right in, in the united states so yes they've been working for years on all of this okay so uh seventh noahide law says that we are obligated to have courts of justice that will enforce the six noahide laws okay the seventh is the courts having a courts of justice right now there are already Noahide judges being trained and they're going to Israel every year to being trained with Sanhedrin to be Noahide judges. Right, wow. Exactly, this was in their Arut Sheva, you know, mm -hmm. in, in their news called Arut Sheva. And yeah. I, 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 I prepared this here to show you, but I didn't know we're gonna go all into this. So all of this has been already in preparation. And now let's talk about United Nations because I just want to say a little bit about United Nations. <laughs> and, and right, United Nations. You know how there was a talk that uh, Trump wants to take us out of United Nations? Yes, he said that before he was in. Yeah. Right. Well, he never did. We, we still are. Know. And in fact, yeah, the World Health Organization and this whole Corona thing, this is all run by global United Nations. World Health is part, of, it's under the United Nations. Yes, it is. Yes. You know, so all of this, but in the future, I suspect, because uh, Jews are actually uh, trying to get rid of United Nations and they want to move United Nations into Jerusalem. And they want to give power to the Sanhedrin. This is like future. Wow. In future. This is going to come in stages. They already have organization by name EMET, E-M-E-T. Uh, I forgot what it exactly stands for. And they are yeah. already getting signatures to get rid of the United Nations and then make a, a headquarters of international law in future Jerusalem. Uh, they're preparing infrastructure of Jerusalem as a headquarters of the New World Order, okay? And that's where they're going to welcome their new Messiah. And this is when they're going to give power over to the Sanhedrin. 
Mm. And as you know, Sanhedrin has been born in 2004. And yes, right now they don't have much power. Their power is kind of like in the background with their influence. Yeah. Okay. They're, they're still having pretty much power because they're kind of under the shadow. <laughs> they're influencing Israeli government. And, and a lot of those Sanhedrin rabbis are the speakers for the Noahide laws. And they're mm. already asking Palestinian workers inside of the state of Israel, any Arab Palestinian people who work in there, they have to sign a piece of paper that they are going to be under Noahide laws. Otherwise, what? Oh yeah, otherwise they would lose their jobs. Wow. These, these elite rabbis inside of the state of Israel are already pushing Noahide laws on any Gentiles living inside of Israel. Wow. Yes. So what I think this is, because they're coming with this morality, you know, that this is something that joins us together as Christians and Jews, the morality. And they're coming, you know, of course we are pro-life. Of course we are against abortions. But Jews are coming in with this, okay, we are for the same causes as you. We are going to come all together. So it's all under this deception. Jesus. Yes, that's right. Amen. Yesterday, I posted on my Facebook. I don't know if you saw it. I posted on my Facebook uh, a little video that they have about Noah laws and how beautifully they're talking about this. United right. Nations video. Um, if you want, you can play it so people can see with what kind of beautiful language they are luring people into the Noahide laws. What do you mean? Say that again. Oh, this is on my Facebook. Okay. Well, I would have to go in there. I wanted to play this. Was first. it the one that you said? I read one where you said it about uh, the Zionists. Was it that one or another one? No, there is a video. It's a very short video. Oh, they, okay. I didn't say that. Okay, I got you. They're, they're promoting this Noahide laws, and it's all on the peace and safety and morality and unity. Gotcha. Uh, you know, the, 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 they dress it up with peace, safety, yes. morality, unity. But this morality, that's, that's where the Noahide laws come in, the morality. Yes, gotcha, gotcha. I'm afraid of any kind of marches or anything when, when Jews and Christians and Muslims and all faiths get together. I know, amen. Because Yeah, uh, which is called ecumenical, which I want to explain to all of you out there watching that uh, when they're talking about the Noahide laws, the reason this is important to us is because our State Department, okay, I was there when they did this, the State Department has formed a department, which Jana talked to y'all about the other night, the uh, International Religious Freedom. Underneath the International Religious Freedom is the Abrahamic Space Initiative. This is the group that is trying to, uh, or is doing this one world religion. Okay, so the Orthodox Jews or the Hasidic Jews, the ones that you're saying is the ones behind putting together the Noahide laws, they work in the UN every day. Yes. Every day. If you don't believe it, go to their website, noahide.org. Go yes. to un.org. Go to UN and type in Noahide laws. I mean, yep. if you think we are a bunch of conspiracy theorists, then go to the UN and look it up yourself. It is there. I, I just want to tell y'all, Yana, that I just found out about the Noahide laws when I was in Washington. <laughs> I didn't even know about it before. Well, how, how has this been kept a secret all these years? Yes, June, I want to comment on this because Noahide laws were big, big secret. However, the rabbis were getting more and more brave and they were coming out with it, promoting it and teaching it, okay, within churches, yes. So, um, but Christians as a whole were totally unaware that Noahide laws exist. They were yeah. totally unaware that Noahide laws in, in the United States law system, they didn't know presidents are signing them. Right. They didn't know that the that, that United States has an education day 
USA every year when they're celebrating a racist rabbi. Mm -hmm. Rabbi who said that Gentiles are animals yeah. and, and in the United States. Okay, <laughs> do, do you know Cohen? Cohen is the head of uh, Noahide. Yes, he is. Oh, yes. All right. Well, he's the, he's the one who promotes it and he's the one who organizes speeches and con conventions, Noahide conventions. Well, they had a, such a convention in 2016. And uh, at the time, right before elections of President Trump. Mm -hmm. And at that convention, uh, Cohen have uh, informed everybody that Noahide laws are now part of 2030 agenda. Yes. yes. I believe that. I sure do after studying it. Yana, they're asking online if Steve can come back and talk to us. They're wanting to hear from him as well. Well, sure. that's fine. I was trying to give her enough time so I could get some of this for you so you know where we're coming from. Because uh -huh. Yana got on the seven Noahide laws and talking about the robbery. So let me, let me show you guys something. Okay. All right. This here is called the San, uh, let's go, Sanhedrin. All right, the second wow. mood in this can uh, number three. All right, so that way you know this is just one right. about a twenty volume set of Talmud. All right, and I'm twenty in, volumes. It takes about twenty books for you to be able. That's the one over here. Uh, let me show you the. Wow! Look at that. Way back over here. This is not. That's your Talmud right there. When people want to know what a Talmud is. All what? these here, that's Talmud by itself. Mm -hmm. Okay. It was codified in yes. uh, about a thousand years after the Jesus. one right here is the Zohar. That's 23 volumes. Wow. This, uh, uh, over here is the Midrash. Midrash is about, I don't know, 25, 26 volumes. What? Yes. Now, now, are these all Jewish fables? I mean, what are these? These are, yeah, this is Jewish law. The Jews call this the Torah. Oh. Yes. They call this the oral law. Right. All right. Wow. For those who want to reference this, though, we're in, we're in the section called Sanhedrin 57A. And what I want you to be able to see is how that the rabbis come to the conclusion that they can execute Gentiles on more things than what you find in the Torah. All right? So it starts off by saying, a heathen is executed for the violation of three precepts, adultery, bloodshed, and blasphemy. But then there's a an objection by one of the rabbis. He says, now, bloodshed is rightly included since it is written, whosoever shed the blood of a man by man shall be right. shed. But hence, do we or where do we know the others if they are derived from bloodshed? The other four should be included, while as if their inclusion is taught by the extended phrase, any man. Should not idolatry too be included? A heathen is executed for the violation of four precepts, including idolatry. But is a heathen executed for idolatry? Surely it has been taught with respect to idolatry, such acts for, for which a Jewish court decrees sentence of death on, on Jewish delinquents are forbidden to the heathen. This implies that they are merely forbidden, but violation is not punishable by death. Now that's their argument there. But then Rabbi Judah goes on to say, a heathen is executed for the violation of the seven Noahide laws. The divine law, having revealed this one murder, it applies to all. Okay, mm. so now as a heathen executed for robbery, has it not been taught with respect to robbery if one stole or robbed or seized a beautiful woman? All right, but he goes on down. Now they use the word uh, Akuthian. Akuthian is a Samaritan. But a Samaritan was considered a Gentile. That's written right in their own uh, Midrash. Wow. So, by an Israelite may be retained, but if robbery is a capital offense, should not the Tana have taught he incurs a penalty? All right. They go on to say, though, it applies to withholding a laborer's wage 
One Kuthian from another or a Kuthian from, or a Gentile from, a, from an Israelite is forbidden, but an Israelite from a Gentile is permitted. All right, now that's dealing on wages, but then he also in this section goes into theft and he says, it's okay for the Jew to steal from the Gentile, but the Gentile can't steal from the Jew. So right. this is where we have this written at, and in the Midrash, he states there, um, Oh, this is another one that's important. It's a little different, though. Uh, this is from, it says here, this a survival of old Semitic tribal law that regarded theft, a robbery, as a crime against the state and consequently punishable by death. Mm. Like, the point I'm trying to make in reading these is that yeah. it's very confusing when you read Talmudic uh, arguments. It's basically like attorneys citing different sources as to how they're going to justify their actions like supreme court cases i was thinking that right. when you said that's exactly what i was thinking yeah that's right so what they do in the talmud they're they're all these rabbis are citing different cases that have happened in time to justify what they're going to do and in this particular chapter here they're discussing how they can justify putting to death Gentiles for all the seven laws of uh, what they call the seven laws of Noah. Noah never right. wrote, he did not write these laws at all. Exactly. Okay. Amen. Right. Amen. But they call them Noahide laws, even though it doesn't apply. And right. they, what they're doing is they're taking and they're citing their different cases through time to justify more than what the see the scripture had given in the Ten Commandments that if you shed man's blood, then your blood would be shed. Now, that's the actual one thing that Noah says. Only one, and that was the one. If you shed the blood of a man, then blood should be shed. All right? But in the case here, they know that that's all he give. So now they're trying to justify all the other laws for death, and they're citing their different cases to say, oh, because of this, we can kill them. Mm. All right? Yana talks about sub-laws, and this is not even... You have to understand, any Orthodox rabbi that has another statement in there, that's part of what they call oral law, and it supersedes God's own commandments according what? to Orthodox Judaism. Yes. Wow. According to the Talmud, the rabbis on earth have a more power yes. than God himself. Yes. Wow. Well, that in another message. Well, Steve, can you answer this for us, for uh, Americans that, you know, have never been to Israel? I've, I've never been to Israel, but I really want to go one day. Is when, when you think of the country of Israel, okay, we just see it as they're all Jews. Like we, we don't, I don't think we realize that there's different, you know, Jews or sections or whatever you want to call it. Can you talk to us in like, you know, little simple language and explain to us about just what the culture of Israel is and how can the, you know, we consider like Netanyahu the president, like how can Netanyahu go along with something that goes against the very fabric of who God was, you know, like, cause he's trying to present it to the world that Israel is the same Israel that was back in the Bible. And it's, you know, they're still honoring the same laws of the Old Testament. They're still good, which is why the evangelicals are buying into it and why they're throwing all their money at Israel. Cause they believe they are, you see what I mean? Like the same yeah. Jews from back then. And so, but when you look at what they're doing, it's opposite of the way that we understand God, because God would never partner with idols. This, you know, they're making Jerusalem the capital of the ecumenical world. All of the religions are moving in on Jerusalem, even the LGBT, y'all. Even yeah. the LGBT, everybody's making Jerusalem the capital. And now I hear from you. They're wanting to make the UN in Jerusalem the capital. And I'm sitting there thinking, how I just can't understand how he can run this country and not have it match the way that we see, read the, the real Bible. Right. Here's where the problem so comes. So explain it to us, please. Here's where it comes in. 
And, I, and I'm going to I'm going to first address the issue with Netanyahu. Then I'll go to what the country. Okay. Wants. All right. Yes. Sir. All right. When Netanyahu says that Israel today is like it was 2,000 years ago, yeah. I, I agree with him. But the problem is, is what Christians seem to have forgotten is what Israel was like 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago, Israel was so much into idolatry, it wasn't even funny. And when the Messiah did come, wow. and he began to call them out for what they really were and, and how they were doing in the nation, they, they were totally, he was totally rejected. Wow. Uh, that's the same thing happening today. The Christians that are there, the believers in Jesus that are there, they are still rejected. And the leaders that are there, just like 2,000 years ago, they're connected with Rome and an alliance with Rome like it was. Wow. And are you saying are even the evangelicals are persecuted, the real ones? The, the Jewish believers. Now, the evangelicals that are supporting Netanyahu. That's yeah, the, yeah, that's yeah. Them. I know about them. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But the Christians there, they live under persecution on a daily basis. What? Soon I have wrote an open letter to, to Benjamin Netanyahu, and I call him, uh, he's guilty of hypocrisy, because he is making alliances with Christians of this country only for one reason, money, uh, money and support, because amount of money that Christians put into Israel and organizations in Israel. I want to tell the world, and you can read that open letter on our website, I wrote it to Netanyahu, because um, the world needs to know that Christian, Jewish Christians, that means Jews or Israelis who live inside of the state of Israel, and they come to the faith of Jesus Christ, are persecuted. In wow. Israel. They are heavily persecuted. I had they're no idea. That their, that their passports are taken away. Their what? citizenship are taken away. Their spouses, if they're not Jews, uh, they're separated from their spouses, okay? And their uh, Gentile spouses are sent back to their country. And we know this what? for a fact. We know it for a fact. Wow. They cannot register their newborns, okay? Not like in America. If you're born in America, you're an American, not in Israel. Yeah. Not in Israel. If you are a Jew, let's say you are a Jew, and then somebody tells you a gospel and you come to Jesus. Israeli government persecutes you. You what? are under, yes, he's gonna be right back. He needs to just leave for a one. Yes, second. that's fine. Uh huh. Yes. So there is a major persecution of uh, Christians in Israel when you are Israeli Christian. Wow. If if they try to have a worship houses, the uh, Orthodox Jews use rocks. Okay, and they destroy those worship houses. What? Yes, they beat up their children. They spit on them. And they Man. walk by. They walk by and they reject their Jewishness. Do you know what Aliyah is? Aliyah? This is I've a law. heard of it. Yeah, it's a law of return, meaning that any Jew living anywhere can return to Israel under Aliyah and get Israeli citizenship. Yes. Now, Aliyah is given to all Jews of the world. You can be atheist Jew, you can be secular Jew, you can be Orthodox Jew or a Reformed Jew. You're going to get Aliyah, but right. you, have go, you have to go through an interview, okay, before you take Aliyah and you go to live in Israel. And they, right. ask, they ask you one, many questions, but then there is one question. Do you believe in Jesus? Wow. You say yes, that you are a Christian and you believe in Jesus, but you're a Jew and you want to go live in Israel. Your mother was a Jew and you want to get Aliyah, the citizenship, okay? Right. They will immediately reject it. So atheist wow. Jew can go live there. Secular Jew can go live there. Reformed Jew can go live there and get citizenship. Orthodox Jew can, but Christian Jew is immediately rejected. And wow. This, 
Yes, and this is the That's country fact. that our country and our Christians here are making alliance with that kind of country that persecutes wow. believers in Jesus. Wow. So, no wonder reason the scripture says, after you've received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. All right. Christians are, are really do not realize the danger they are in. Uh, in so not supporting what Israel is doing is one thing, but what's happening is a lot of these people are actually uh, going to embrace the rebuilding of the third temple. They're going to embrace sad. sacrifices. And when they do that, they're going to reject Jesus Christ as the living sacrifice. Yes. And, you know, I mean, uh, it's, it's really, really, really sad. Uh, so go back to Steve, go back and tell us about the culture as far as like i know you said that there are it, some christians there but uh what not, how many not, jews are there like what's it's, the deal it's about, it's about six million jews live in israel uh, oh wow this is this is what we have statistically but you have to understand israel is a very much of a melting pot uh we have about two million russians that live in israel uh, wow. and Israel as uh, quote unquote Russian Jews, and uh, some may be, some may not be. Uh, that's really debatable. Most of them are not uh, practicing Jews. Uh, mm. you know, this is just the way it was done. We have Bedouins, uh, which to me, the Bedouins are some of the nicest, what we would call Arabic people in the world. The Bedouins yeah. is, is, are the people that live in the deserts. Uh, that still herd the, the the goats and the sheep and things like that, mainly goats. Uh, yeah. By, it's almost like biblical times with these people here. Very hospitable, very lovely people. Uh, they're they're kind of a minority though uh, in the country. Aww. Uh, but the uh, but and the thing is, is their 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 lands are being stolen from them by the state of Israel, saying and running them off. And these people have been there for years. I have known many of them there. Yeah. Uh, and and the most honest you'll ever meet are your Bedouins too. Uh, but but then we have we have the the regular Palestinians uh, that are in the West Bank. Um, and the Palestinians are a mixture of both Christians and Arabs. But there's one thing that about Palestinians most people do not even know. The, about 50% of your Palestinians are called crypto Jews. They, mm. they, they do not practice Judaism. Uh, many of them are Muslims. But what happened is when 70 AD came and the destruction of the temple and Rome when they were leaving, they did not force the Jews that lived in the countryside from the land. They wanted them to stay in order to farm the land. They remained Jews for all the way until the Ottoman Empire overtook the country and they were forced to convert to Islam on pain mm. of death. Wow. Right? So 50% of your Palestinians are crypto Jews. And the funny thing is, me knowing this, and knowing that when uh, when uh, Israel first became a nation in 48, the prime minister then, Ben-Gurion, had sent a team of Jewish rabbis in amongst them, trying to bring them back into Judaism because he knew that they were actually Jews. Wow. And, and they the problem was they were more like Karite Jews. They still believed the words of Moses, but they did not believe the oral law. And a good friend of mine. Uh, well, they shouldn't, with, should they? No, they shouldn't. They should. Oh, okay. That's, yeah, yeah. They should, they should only believe the Torah, not the oral. Right, law. right. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. They, and I've heard these stories, known about them, but a good friend of mine is a doctor. His, the girl that works his pharmacy, she's Palestinian. One day we were talking about what's going on in Palestine, uh, over in Israel and in the, in the West Bank which they call Palestine. And she says to me, me never spoke to her about this. She said, you know what gets me, Stephen, that really upsets me about the Jewish people in Israel is that they say they are Jews, but many of us, we are Jews. We were the real Jews from the house of Judah. 
And mm-hmm. I said, do you actually know that? She says, my family has known that. It has been part of our tradition through our whole lives. She wow. said, do you think they care about us? No. Uh, and then we have we have others. Uh, we have Armenians that live there in Israel. Uh, you do? Have, you have Armenians? Oh, yes. In fact, oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah, and they're some of the kindest people you'd ever want to oh, meet. Oh, I know some nice Armenians, yes. Yes, yes, uh, and and just very, very precious people. And, uh, you know, and of course, they were genocide by the Catholic Church, uh, and this is one reason why we have so many Armenians that are living in Israel. But, uh, and then we have, uh, let's see, the Druze. The Druze is another ethnic group living there. Uh, and of course, when we say this, we have in all these groups, we have a lot of Christians. So Christians are, are, are very, very formidable a number of people, especially amongst Palestinians. There are many Christians among the Palestinians, well over a million Christians there. And the odd thing is, wow. the Palestinian Christians stand more for Christ and more for truth than most Christians ever thought of. Like, for example, the American... Uh. They, they, the, the Jews have put in a, in a, in a, uh, uh, in a, uh, what do you call it there, a uh, museum up in Haifa. They put Jesus on a cross with a, some kind of sacrilegious theme on. Do you remember what that was? I forget what it was. Very sacrilegious way they did it. They were mocking the, the, the crucifixion of Christ, and the 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 american christians would not speak against it but the palestinian christians went and protested in front of the the museum in haifa until it was removed hmm. but where were the american christians oh we can't offend netanyahu no 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 we can't offend israel that's just them expressing their feelings towards christianity because after all christianity has done so much evil to the jews we, after all, we're responsible for burning down their temple. No, Jesus prophesied it was going to be burned to the ground and not one stone would be left upon another because of mm-hmm. the idolatry that Israel was involved in. So, right. Yes, June, right, I don't know right. if you're familiar with the fact that now they have um, Ninth of Av. That's a new kind of a holiday for, for the Christians here that Jews have instituted. Uh, no. Well, ninth of Av uh, is, is, the, is the date in the Hebrew calendar of the destruction of the first and second temple. Right. So and, now and they, they want Christians to uh, repent for burning down the temple, for temple being destroyed. And on wow. The ninth, yes, and on the ninth of Av, a lot of Christians, and especially groups like Mark Bill's groups and all of these Hebrew roots and all of that, they started to like collectively pray and repent for the temple being destroyed well how do you think about um prophecy that jesus gave the temple will be destroyed in 70 a.d we we see in history this happened as a fulfillment of the prophecy as a judgment Mm -hmm. that god had on the jewish system so why would christians need to repent for this it's beyond me well, we see a lot of that happening now where they're asking them to repent for everything. Yes. You yes. know, repent to the Native Americans, repent to, I mean, every, you know, everywhere. Mm-hmm. Right. But I'm looking at it now when you said that about the 9th of Av. To mm-hmm. you that want to research this, it's AV, the 9th of Av, AV. Yeah, uh, it's actually on the Shabbat website. <laughs> Chabad, yes, yes, it is. Yes, Chabad. Mm-hmm. On the yeah. night of God, they wanted all the Christians. They came, Christians and Jews come together, and then then Christians repenting and praying for forgiveness for the temple being destroyed. Now this is insanity. It is. Christians should know better. This was fulfillment of prophecy. You know. Oh, wait a minute! Wait a minute! That's are you issue. wait a minute are you saying when jesus destroyed the temple yeah when they're jesus, having us apologize for jesus yes yes, yes. well we jesus to told, and cry because, he told the apostles there would not be one stone here left right yes 
So he didn't physically do it, but he did, he did say he did prophesy it was going to happen. And he why? did. Because he sure they did. Rejected their Messiah. Wow. So if you go out there and start saying, "Oh, we're so sorry for what we did." Oh, wow. Lord we have mercy. This. Oh my gosh. I mean, the chickens need to change their tune instead of going Trump, Trump, Trump. They need to do something about Trump. Trump, 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 Trump. <laughs> No, I, I was just telling my friends, I said, don't you dare apologize for God and don't apologize for Jesus. Yeah. If God has it in the word, then we are to back him up. We want him to back us up, don't we? So why should we apologize? Because Jesus did that. That would be like, because the Lord gave me a word to give the church and the word was, the judgment that's here and the judgment that's coming to a greater level, not to apologize for what God is going to do in the earth. As far as judgment, yeah. we can't apologize when, when God judges cities and judges the nation. Judgment is holy. God is holy. You know exactly. what I mean? So that's terrible that they do this. I didn't realize they did this. Thank you for telling me this. What did Jesus say? And this is what people don't realize how dangerous it is. I mean, this is not this is not skim milk. This is serious. Jesus, right. said, if you deny me before man, I will deny That's right. you before the Father. So when they Come go on. out there and they hey. start denying Jesus Christ and what He says and what He prophesies, That's right. That's right. I mean, their sins then ex don't expect him to be standing there for you on that that's day. right amen that's right absolutely absolutely that's right well listen before we get off here i want y'all to talk to the bride because first there is a question that i saw in the thing that people are wanting to ask you mr stephen is uh, about the hundred and forty four thousand. now a lot of people believe we're getting ready to step into tribulation it talks about the 144,000 Jews that will be roaming the earth. You'll have all the different tribes and they'll be witnessing during that time. Can you tell us what your understanding is of the 144,000? Let's, let's take and let me, let's come back on that on a different program where we can okay. discuss that issue alone. Um, okay. It would take a lot more than just a few minutes to go into that. So let's say okay. that. Okay. But, but I will say one thing, though, that I think will be a big blessing for those that were listening to the program uh, when we were there in Atlanta, uh, Sister uh -huh. Jean, when I came home, you know, two of the revelations I got while I was speaking, you know, and that's just what happens to me. I, and, and I did not, I, when I, after I finished speaking, I had no clue what I said either. <laughs> I told you, I, said, I know that the Lord revealed something. I've got to go back and listen to what it was because I want to know what it was. I, said, I just know that it was really amazing and I got to see what it was. It was amazing. One of the ones was the issue about the thorns and the thistles. And oh, I, I cried. Finishes, right? Oh. Oh, Sister June, uh, Sister June, listen. I, I come after I listen oh. to what it was, he began to reveal more and more and more to me on that same issue. Oh my I'll goodness. Tell you one. I'll tell you just one for the sake of the bride listening tonight. And that was, he took me back to when, uh, when God was speaking to Moses from the burning bush. And as I told yes. you, that's a, the word Sinai means thorn bush. Okay, we say eight Sinai, it's a thorn bush, and it was right. God speaking from the middle of the thorn bush. But if you'll notice, this is what the Lord pointed me to Moses was so amazed that why was the bush not consumed? Okay, the fire was in it, but why was it not consumed? Right, right, right. It was a prophecy laying right there just in just in a i don't know what you call that an, an, in an allegory but it was a prophetic al uh, 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 allegory if yeah. that's the word and what it was was because it was showing that when christ would come among the thorns because you have to remember in that prophecy in luke jesus is showing you that you don't get grapes from thorns nor figs from thistles 
He says, by right. them, you shall know them. Now, so what he's saying yes. is, is that the Pharisees and Sadducees, they were not from the true root that, uh, uh, of the fig tree. They were not part of a grapevine. Christ, right. is the, he is the root, right? He's the root. Yes. Uh, uh -huh. Okay. So they weren't from that. So he said they were from thorns and thistles. And as I said that day, what the Lord revealed to me that day in Atlanta was the only fruit the Pharisees had to offer was what they were, and that was thorns. Okay, so they planted a crown of thorns. Now, some people will tell you, no, that was the Romans that did it. Oh, no, it wasn't. In the Hebrew, see, all it says in the Greek is that the soldiers planted a crown, put a crown of thorns on his head, so everybody assumes it was the Romans. But in the Hebrew, Matthew, it says that the soldiers of the temple guard, which, and it calls them Pharisees, they planted the crown of thorns and put it on his head. So the Pharisees were from a thorn bush. The only fruit they had was thorns, right? Going back to yeah. what happened with Moses, God was in the middle of the bush, but the flame of fire didn't consume the thorn bush. Why? When Jesus, it was showing that when Jesus Christ came and he would be in the middle of the thorns, the middle of the Pharisees, and they crowned his head with the thorns, that at that time he would not consume them for their sins, but rather he would forgive them. This is why the bush was not consumed in Moses' time. Just like with Jesus, he was in the middle of the thorn, in the middle of the thorn. Wow. He had mercy and he said, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. Wow. Right? That's wow, wow, wow. Is that right there was mercy. Wow. The day we're living it is in is mercy. No, wait, wait. I'm thinking of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. There you go. No. Jesus was in the fire. Yes, he was. Wow. Yes, he was. Right. So it's like the burning bush was fire. Yes. The burning bush. Oh, my goodness. There you go. Wow. That's a beautiful analogy. No, wait a minute. Wait. Because the Christians, right. when, when, we, when we tell people, okay, we're, we're on fire for God. We're on fire. Sometimes you feel his presence, Stephen and Yana, and it's like you're on fire. I mean, you're just burning from head to toe. That is such a revelation. I'm just, I mean, oh, it's beautiful. That's beautiful. Go back to what you just got. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now we're coming in the final hour. The thorns and the thistles are still here, and we're in the middle of them. What do you think they used to be able to make that fire? Thorns and thistles. They used sticks and branches. They made the fire. Right. But Christ will be with us when the, when the fire does come down and consume the thorns and thistles. He will be with us, and we will not be burnt by the fire of his judgment. But at that time, God was showing through this with Moses that the thorn bush would not be consumed when Christ spoke from the middle of it. And so when Jesus came, he was among the thorns, the Pharisees, but he showed mercy. But the day is coming now. We're coming to judgment. And now yeah. that mercy has come to an end. And this is why it's so important to know what side you stand on. You know what else is going through my heart right now? Because when you consider how all of humanity began, Stephen, when Moses was up on the mountain with God and, and when you study how God revealed himself to mankind and he stood up there and there was the lightnings and there was the thunderings and there was the earthquakes and, you know, he was saying, I am that I am. And then when he created the temple, when he told Moses how to do the tabernacle, and then you understand the heaviness of sin, the weightiness of sin, and how God was in the Holy of Holies, and how sin was all on the outside, and, and how God felt about sin. And whenever God walked out of the temple, you knew if God had to come out of the Holy of Holies, if he had to step into them outer courts, somebody's going to die. There's, he cannot be around sin. He's just that holy. 
And then when you go all the way to today and you got all of these big leaders out here partnering with sin, it's just so sad because it's like people and they, they sit here and now they're telling people that sin is not going to take you to hell. You know, that like them partnering with the LGBT and, and them partnering with all these idols and these other religions. It is so sad because these people are going to die and go to hell because these leaders are not telling them God is holy. You know, you've got to, you can't do that because he cannot be around that. You see what I mean? But when, what I'm saying is, is when you think of Jesus with the crown and you think of Moses on the mountain and Moses with the burning bush, all of that is a revelation of his fire. You know, you're either going to burn on fire on earth, which is what is fire, Stephen and Yah? It's a purification. It's a That's constant right. death. It's a burning. It's a cleaning. So it's a, he's always taking that sin out and removing and, and changing you and molding you and making you, you see. But when you consider how this whole situation is happening right now, it's very sad because it's not the same God. This is the whole point. The Bible says there is another Jesus that is taught. Does it not? That's right. There is a, this other Jesus that's taught out here is the one that is partnering with the perversion, just like in the old Israel, partnering with the perversion, partnering with the apostasy, partnering with idols. And it's the one that does not cause you to, you know, walk in holiness and accept. You see what I mean? Yeah. Well, you know, the bad thing is, sister, is they, they, again, they're wanting Barabbas. You know, they're calling for, for a murdering spirit to be released. But, um, well, he said, Jesus told them, you don't accept me, and I came in my father's name, but the one who will come in his own name, him, him, you, him you will receive. receive. I, I, used to, I said, that, and of course, I know it doesn't apply to Trump, but I, I use that as an analogy when they were so doing the praises of Trump and Israel. They put a city after his name. They put streets after his name. And I said, you know, it's interesting. I said, Christ, you wouldn't accept. I said, you'll take yeah. this man here in his own name. I said, Donald <laughs> wow. Trump. Wow. Right. Wow, that I never thought about that. Yeah, yeah. very sad. well. Not only that, he everything is in his name. The open open up America plan is in his name. Yeah, and look the, what uh, have done. It's no longer Jesus. It's everything is Trump, Trump, Trump. Yeah, I know, and it's really sad. I, I understand. Well, I just want to thank y'all for coming on tonight because thank I you. wanted the church to see that persecution is here and I wanted them to hear it from you about how it relates to the morality trying to be displayed by the Orthodox Jews or by the Kabad organization and your understanding of Israel and the culture of Christianity, you know, the uh, religion that we have of Christianity versus what we're actually seeing today coming out of Israel. And the, I mean, I, it's, I can't thank y'all enough for coming tonight. Is the, let me open this up to you right now before we get off here. Is there anything that you are just burning to tell the bride uh, to prepare them for persecution or whatever? You've got the floor. Go well, I, I want to tell the bride that uh, when it comes to this Noah high laws, this is part of 2030 agenda. And I think it's going to happen after they say, you know, they will declare if, after all of this chaos, when a new world religion comes together because Vatican accepted Noahide laws. In fact, everybody was waiting for the Sunday law to be made mandatory, like the seven day Adventists were mm -hmm. saying. Yeah. The Sunday law. And it was a huge shock and surprise to everyone then he declared Saturday Jewish Sabbath as, as you know, he didn't declare Sunday. Wow. Wow. He, yeah, he declared Jewish rabbinic style Sabbath as the day, not the Sunday. And he accepted yeah. Noahide laws. But I also want to say and remind them that when you hear the word Israel, Israel is not country. Israel is people. It's people. 
Mm. It's not country. Right. In the Bible, when it speaks of Israel, of God, it's the people, it's the ones, Jews, Gentiles, together, all tribes, languages, and nations who come in the name of Jesus Christ. That's Israel of God, not today's political, geological, yes. right there, state of Israel. This is a counterfeit. That's the counterfeit kingdom that they are creating. But what about Jerusalem, though, being the capital? I mean, you know, the Bible says pray for the peace of Jerusalem, right? Well, Bible says that. However, in the book of Hebrews, it says that we are to focus on the heavenly Jerusalem. That's our mother. Oh, heavenly yeah. Jerusalem. There is a heavenly Mount Zion and a heavenly kingdom with heavenly Jerusalem. And Apostle Paul and book of Hebrews is clearly describing that the, the book of Revelation says that the earthly Jerusalem is Sodom and Egypt. Why they are Sodom? Because they are leaders of LGBT and transgender agenda. Mm -hmm. Why they are Egypt? Because they have Egypt doctrines of Kabbalah, Zohar, you know, and yeah, then, uh, there's another reason why they're Egypt as well. All right. And this is what a lot of people are not aware of either. They're Egypt because when they mingled the seed in Babylon, they were mentioned mentions the different nations they mingled their seed with and the Egyptians were one of those. All right. And according to my White House source, uh, he told me through a deep study of the Rothschilds and Rockefellers, which are the, the, the families that, that bought the land and established the state of Israel, that he was documents that he had available that are not available to the public. He yeah. Traced their bloodline to the royal house of Egypt. All right. And so he told me, he said, they're not real Jews, Steve. He says they are royalty of Egypt. So they were part of the cross breeding of the priest family, the coining family that were, uh, that were mingled the seed through the Nephilim bloodlines of the Egyptian uh, uh, house uh, uh, back in, in, in those times there. And so therefore, when it says that they are Sodom and Egypt, right. we, and if Sodom didn't just represent uh, homosexuality, it also represented Nephilim bloodlines, and we know this because of the book of Jude. The book of Jude shows you that as well. So, what does this say in the book of Jude? Because now I'm thinking, I knew in the Sodom and Gomorrah that the judgment, because I just wrote the book about judgment and I examined a lot of the Old Testament judgments that God did. There was two or three reasons that God judged uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. One was because of their perversion of course and the other was because of their how they treated poor people mm -hmm. yes if you read yes. in jude jude okay. says in the fourth verse uh because there's only one chapter for there are certain men that crept in unaware who were before of old ordained to this condemnation the only people that were ever foreordained to condemnation were nephilim and we know this from the book of hmm. Enoch. All right, but it goes on to say, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. Yeah. Okay. And denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I will therefore put your remembrance. He's now he's going to tell you about it, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. And the angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath observed, he reserved to everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Even yeah. if Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example of suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. That strange flesh is not homosexuality. I just thought I just called on to that. Okay, I never thought I never heard of this. There it is. It, wow. Is the reptilian race. And wow. The angels that kept not their first estate but left their Yeah, own. yeah. Oh, I knew. Yes, I definitely called on to that. Yes. 
right but wow. you know it's say that people in the israelis today they're normal people like you and i yeah they are but the the leaders that created the state are rush childs even streets are named after them and they and well rush let me tell you what i found out little missy i can confirm this because somebody back when i was discovering uh about the whole deal of you know the uh noahide laws and all this and i did my research for my book i discovered and bride this is gonna shock you to all of you like me that have, was israel lovers to the bone this is gonna shock you but israel started in 1948 stephen tell me if i'm wrong but israel started in 1948 by the rothschilds yes by yes. the u.n right Right. The UN is exactly. the one that put in Israel. I yes. could not believe it. And you know why? I was like, you can't make this stuff up. No. It, it and at the same time, they formed the UN. They also formed the, what else did they uh, form, Bride? But they formed the World Council of Churches. Yes. You got to look at the connection here. Pope Pius I mean, it's also like, was working. A lot of people don't know this as well. Pope Pius, what is it? The 12th, is that his number? I forget. The Pope that was the Pope when Israel became a nation. Pope Pius, yeah. I, guess, you know, uh, I may have that number wrong. Maybe he's a 10th. But anyway, when he was the Pope, before he was Pope, when he was a Cardinal, he worked for the Rothschilds. He actually got a loan for the Vatican for I think something like $15 million at the time, back in the what? world. Yes, so when he became Pope, uh, he already had the connection to the Rothschilds, and of course, when they were forming the state of Israel. Now, he was complicit in the death of uh, many Jews as well, but he also was helping the elite families to escape and to go to and to go to uh, Palestine at that time, uh, but yet turning a blind eye while the while the uh, uh, while the uh, elite Jews were allowing the poor Jews to be murdered in the in the in the death camps. All right, so so there's that connection right there. And then when uh, when Ben Gurion, when he was a president, or excuse me, uh, excuse me, the prime minister. Uh, it was uh, the second prime minister, and I can't think of his name right off the top of my head, but he was the one that was working. Uh, in fact, the state of Israel, Ben-Gurion wanted to call the state of Israel uh, the, the state of Judah. But it was, let me pull it up. I get it right, so I get my, 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 my words here right. Uh, uh, but, the, but the second prime minister of Israel, uh, he actually... Uh, um, excuse me just one second here he actually went and met with uh, pope pius uh and uh and when he did he he was actually uh i'm trying to get it so i want to make sure i get this just right uh oh gosh what is his name i'm trying to think of his name too and i can't think of it uh hang on uh um he met with he met with the pope of rome and when he did, um, the Pope of Rome uh, actually got him to call, uh, got, got them to call the state yeah. of Israel instead of the state of Judah. And he made Ben-Gurion to change what the state would actually be called at that time. And that was Moshe Sharif. That's, I, I don't know why I'm blank on his name. I know all their names. I've heard the name. Yeah, yeah. Moshe Sharit was the one behind that. And a lot of evils that people don't know that was done. Oh my yeah, gosh. But do you know why June they renamed, uh, they wanted to call the state that we know as Israel today, they wanted to call it state of Judah, but they not named, renamed it Israel. You know why? Why? For the, for the future confusion of the prophecy. Yes. Because when Bible speaks in the New Testament of Israel, of God, it speaks of the spiritual nation, spiritual kingdom, and they wanted to in, in uh, they wanted to infiltrate Christianity just like they did by the plan. Yeah. 
so they can take Christians to their side, so they support, based on false interpretations of prophecies, they support the state, political, Russian yes. state of Israel. And that's exactly what Christians do. They don't yeah. know, see with spiritual eyes that when we speak of Jerusalem, it's heavenly Jerusalem. When we speak of Israel, is the spiritual nation that are in Christ. That's Israel of God, yes. not physical nation. And right. they support the Jews. The, what they are preparing right now is a headquarters for the new world order and for the Messiah, the false Messiah that will be in Jerusalem, earthly Jerusalem. So they were preparing this for a very, very long time. Well, I've got to ask y'all something about the churches. Okay, when we talk about the Hebrew roots and the connection to the Kabod, what, how can a Christian understand what is a real messianic church? Like, is there, is there such thing as a messianic church? And if it is a messianic church, uh how do they know if it's a real one do you see what i'm going with this because of their trying to pull them back can you talk to some people that are maybe in messianic churches and give them some guidance it's really a big mess up is what it is <laughs> i i have to just call it out bluntly you know i was called for, for years um i was always called a messianic believer people would say yeah are you you must be messianic well the reason why they would say that is because i was born to jewish parents even though my parents were not practicing jews uh that still is our whole family legacy uh and we weren't practicing because they didn't want to be killed for being jewish that's the reason a lot of persecution yeah. in america is being jewish back in the uh 50s and 40s and things like that but All right so people just automatically labeled me that but i would always tell them i said i'm not I even was called a rabbi. Uh, I'm not a rabbi. Uh, I'm actually an ordained minister is what I am. But, uh, and I would tell them I'm not a rabbi, but they still would say, Rabbi Stephen Benoon is coming on or something like that, right? Yeah. But as a general rule, when they say they are messianic believers, that's generally people, uh, one of the first people that come to my mind uh, is, is like um, uh, uh, the, the Oh gosh, I'm, I'm blank on his name. The guy in New York. We actually spoke, we had a, a, a nice discussion with him on a debate one time. Um, I don't really know. I don't oh goodness, why am I blank on these? He's names? blank on names today. I'm sorry. Oh yeah, yeah. Anyway, Jonathan Kahn? No, not Jonathan Kahn. I, don't, I, I was thinking of uh, the other guy. He's uh, he's been on with Sid Roth. Sid Roth's a good example too. Sid Roth. I yeah, missed he's him years ago. These are pe these are Jews that became Christians that still hold to some of the, the the basic principles of judaism in other words they may still keep sabbath things like that but uh, uh you know that's normally what messianic is but then you have what they call the messianic that are that are christians that are not even jewish that are trying to embrace uh talmudic laws uh what some of, yes some of them may, Hebrew roots does that more so. But some of the messianics they want to keep all the all the uh, the Levitical laws, or they want to keep uh, the Ten Commandments, things like that. And they don't realize that they're totally rejecting the very thing that Abraham started off with. And this is what, what this was that? faith. Yeah, he believed God's word. Yeah. yeah. Okay, you it was know, that they, simple. I mean, yeah. listen, when Yana said earlier, when she was talking. Um, I forget what it was about, about the city or something like that. Oh no, she's talking about Israel. She said, what is Israel? She said, Israel is everybody, it's Christians. It's, and that's not replacement theology either. Mm -hmm. Because what was it? Abraham believed God. He was not a Jew, he was an Arab. Yeah. Okay, I mean, if you want to take it technically, he was uh, he was a Hittite and his mother was a Perz a Perizzite, I believe. Right? right. And so he was an, not a Muslim, just an Arabic uh, of, of Eastern origin. All right. He believed God and the Bible said it was imputed to him for righteousness. And of course, as Paul says, he was not even circumcised. So he believed God when he was uncircumcised. Then we right. go down, we come all the way down. 
all the great biblical people of faith, including Sarah, including Isaac, Jacob, we get into David, right? All the people, they what did they do? They believed God that He was going to bring forth the promised seed. Now, although they were looking at a physical city, that's really like David you know built the city built the tabernacle God, or he had built it but his son did you know solomon but he god didn't want that in fact the book of hebrews says that god that abraham was looking for a city whose builder and maker was god right abraham had been sitting right there in jerusalem and he said he was looking for it he was in hebron i mean my gosh hebron you can throw a rock and hit it <laughs> yeah and then jacob when he lays down at night, lays his head on the stone, he's right there on the Temple Mount. And yet they say they're looking for a city. All right, whose builder makers got. Why was why was he looking for a city? He met Melchizedek. And Melchizedek, literally the word is uh Melchizedek, is how you say it, Melchizedek, which means uh he is the king of righteousness. All right, he met him. And he knew that if he's a king and he gives him a tenth of all that he ever had, that he must have a people somewhere. He must be the king. And he was the king of Salem, which would be Jerusalem. Yeah. And so he began to look for the city. He meets him. He gives him a tenth of his all after he does the conquering uh, of the country that came down to took his nephew and stuff. Lot. He goes and looks, but he couldn't find it. Why couldn't he find it? That's why he said, I'm a pilgrim and a stranger in a strange land. He calls Jerusalem a strange land. Why? Because Israel are those that believe God that would, like Mary, for example. Do you realize that Mary was the very one that was able to fix the mistake that was made with Sarah? People don't realize Sarah made a mistake. God came down and said to Abraham, Behold, your wife is going to conceive and have a child. She laughs inside of herself. And uh -huh. not her. Abraham laughs too. He said, me being an old guy, I'm not gonna have a baby. And his wife's going, Oh my gosh, I'm I'm gonna have pleasure with my Lord again. I'm gonna have pleasure with him. That can't be. And the answer <laughs> says to Abraham, why did your wife laugh? Right? Why did she laugh about it? In fact, is God decides to make a make a joke back on him. He says, So when the child is born, you're gonna call him Yiksak. Yiksak is Hebrew means he laughs. So the whole time they call this little boy by his name, Yitzhak, Yitzhak, they keep saying, he laughs, he laughs. In other words, God's letting you be reminded that you laughed about my promise. Yeah. Now in, in the book of Hebrews, it says that he was strong in faith, but in reality, he doubted God. Sarah doubted God. And that was a type of the coming of Jesus Christ. And that was the seed of God by faith. And then they believed by faith, they kept producing their kids. Why? Until Mary come along. And then what did Mary do? Mary fixed all the problems that were ever blamed on women. When the angel <laughs> her, see, because they blame me, they blame Eve for what happened in the garden, right? They said yeah. you, you doubted, and that caused the fall, and you took of this and that. See, you doubted. They say Eve doubted. That's why we ended up in this position we're in, mm -hmm. right? right? But when it come down to to Mary, the angel come and says, "Behold, you're going to have a child." She says, "How?" All she does is, "How's it going to be?" The Holy Spirit will overshadow you. Be it unto me, Lord, according to your word. She believed God. And let me tell you something. If she'd not have believed God, we would have no Jesus Christ. Mm. Okay? It took a woman to correct those errors. Sarah doubted. Eve doubted. Sarah doubted. Mary believed it. And it brought yeah. back the promise seed. And if you as a person, whether you're Jew or Gentile or Arabic or Hindu or whatever your religion is, if you will believe on Jesus Christ and he is that promised seed, then the gift is unto you and to as many as far off as the Lord our God shall call. Yes, but I don't that think it, I don't think people understand though the difference between Hebrew roots and not to get involved in that and then a messianic church. What Which probably doing? teaches a lot of the Hebrew roots, this right? Or what? Really, in Hebrew roots is really no different. The only difference is messianic. Like I said, there's some Gentiles claim to be messianic, but they're not messianic. Normally, messianic is a Jew that believes Jesus that still is keeping the law. Whereas 
uh, Michael Brown is a good example. That's what I was thinking of earlier, Michael Brown. But, uh, but, but then you have the Hebrew roots. These are people that think they were Jews, and maybe they were, maybe in their past, their ancestry, yeah. Jewish genealogy. And they're going back and they're embracing not only the Ten Commandments, but Levitical law and sometimes Talmudic law. June, there are Gentiles, okay, who form congregations, put kippah on their head. Yeah. And then they start following Levitical laws and they're calling themselves Messianics. So this is totally, it's a chaos because look, there's one Lord, one faith. We have one shepherd, we have one faith, and it's faith in Christ Jesus. So well, I know a lot of people, the reason that they like the Hebrew roots is because they feel like that they are going back to experience like the Lord in his day. Do you know what I mean? Like they're, I they feel because they understand like Hebrew words and they feel like it makes them more intellectual. You know, because they understand it deep. They feels like it takes them deeper. But what I've noticed, though, Steve, and I don't know why, how the connection comes in, but the people that get involved and they start getting deep into the Hebrew roots, they begin. They change. They they become hard. They right. they may they may feel like they become they're really legalistic. Legalistic. All right. Let me tell you yeah. something seriously about this. As I study the, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and I study them from the Hebrew language. Yeah. So, all right. And knowing the Hebrew language doesn't make you some rocket person or somebody better, by no means. It's just like knowing the Greek. Yes, you might get to be able to see some of what things are written in the original, but still, you're getting, you're learning it from someone that is giving you their interpretation of those words and what they mean. So that makes it more difficult. Uh, I had to advantage of studying multiple different ways so i've got a, more of a variety that i can pick from but yeah when you go back to the law all right one you're rejecting every precept of christianity all right if you really want let me just encourage people like this if you really want to go back and see what were the jews like two thousand years ago and how did they believe what were they looking for when it comes to the messiah don't go back to the Pharisee bloodline to figure that out. All right? Because they were really messed up. Yeah. All right? They were very oral Talmudic tradition to begin with. All right? And, I'm, and I, when I say, well, yeah. please understand, I do not subscribe to the Qumran community and their doctrine. But one thing I will say, if you read the writings that they wrote about the Melchizedek priest, they write there about Melchizedek, and they realized that Melchizedek priesthood, according to what David wrote in Psalm 104, would have yeah. to become a new priestly order altogether. What? Yes. This is why when Paul writes himself, and he said that we knew that there had to come. Now, Paul was a Pharisee, all right? Yeah. So oh, I love Paul. Y'all know I love Paul. That's right. But Paul, <laughs> Paul clearly says, we know that there remained another priest after the order of Melchizedek. In other words, he knew by the Psalm 104, I believe it is, or 110, I forget which chapter for sure, David wrote, that there would come another priest after the order of Melchizedek. All right, the Qumranite community down in Qumran, which were the Zadokite priests that were thrown out by the, by the uh, Maccabees. Yeah. They also knew about that, and they said that that priest that David wrote about would be the Messiah, and they quote all the prophecies that pertain to the Messiah, including Daniel, 924 that that's who that priest would be paul recognized then that if the law was supposed to continue in other words if we were supposed to keep levitical law then the messiah should have come out of aaron but he didn't 
he came out of Judah instead. Right. He came through David's lineage, as he as Paul pointed out, which there's no mention whatsoever of a priestly order after Judah. So why does he come after Judah? Because it was a new covenant, right? A new law. Right. So you go back to Talmudic law, or excuse me, you go back to Levitical law, even. You reject. You are rejecting the Melchizedek priesthood that was prophesied to come to replace Levitical priesthood. And to prove that, Jesus actually even challenges Levitical law as not being accurate in your own Bible. He mm. said, You have heard it said of them of old time an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, if he takes your coat, give him your cloak as well. Right. If he knows you to go a mile, go with him two miles. All right? He, the law of Melchizedek was a law of love. It was a law of mercy. Oh. Okay? It was yeah. not a law of stone. Right. And that's why going to Hebrew roots, you're you're literally doing what I said earlier. If you deny me before man, you will, I will deny you before the Father and His angels. Mm -hmm. no, it's rejection of Christ and grace. To go back to the laws it's, to reject it's re Jesus it's Christ. Rejection of the new covenant that came in the order of Melchizedek. It's rejection of Christ. If you go back yes. into the law, this is a very serious matter. People have got to go back and study the book of Hebrews. Right. Study the book of Galatians. All right, really study it. And those that yeah. are following Hebrew roots, a lot of these people get into Tobia Singer's teachings, and Tobia he really he shreds Paul to pieces. Mm -hmm. But the reason Tobia does, Tobia is a Jewish rabbi, and he doesn't understand Paul. And I have challenged Tobia on this because he, he says Paul says, see, because it represents Christ, not seeds plural, and Tobia makes fun of Paul and says. There's no such word as seeds in the Hebrew language. Oh, yes, there is. If Tobia would have ever read the Dead Sea Scrolls, he would see that they use the word seeds, plural, on a multiple basis. Mm. Right? He just, Tobia, and I don't, I don't want to slam Tobia, because to me, he's like Paul was before he was converted. You know, he's destroying the church, but maybe God will have mercy on the man. Right. Maybe he'll open his eyes. I don't know, but... Anyway, well, Steve, I asked Jana, Yana earlier if she had anything she wanted to warn the bride before we got off here. Do you have anything, sir? The, the one thing that I really encourage people right now, we are in a very late hour. There's no time to play, play church anymore. Right, correct. There, there's really not. I think really and honestly, June, people need to be on their knees and on their faces before God and really seeking the Holy Spirit to lead them and guide them. Stop taking all of man's ideas and words. Even the things that I say here tonight, you know, don't take my word for these things. They need to prayerfully get before the Lord and see. Right. As the Bible says, seek out your own salvation with trembling and fear. Yes, Listen, that's right. Amen. You know, June, I'll tell you something, and I'll say this just in closing on my part here. I had a conversation with a man, and I can't say who this man is, but I will tell you this. I know who he is very well. He works directly with multiple generals at the Pentagon, multiple, as well as uh, uh, colonels, yeah, and majors, and as he said to me, because he knew the things that I've talked about about things that are coming, mm -hmm. and he said to me that very soon people will be able to see with their own eyes up in the heavens above this system that you've been telling people about, Steve. Wow, they're going to be able to see it with their own eyes. What's coming? Wow. And he said, we're probably, he says, I don't know dates or anything. He says, but as far as the chaotic events are going to happen on this earth, he said, we're probably about a year away. And he told me, he said, this is just my personal opinion. He said, I wonder if this won't be the judgment of Almighty God for all the sin mm -hmm. on this earth. He said, that's just my take on it, Steve, my take on it. But right. 
we don't know when the end is. And this thing could go by and not cause the cataclysm that people are expecting it to cause. It may not. Yeah. But if you take into consideration the Noahide laws, Satan's agenda to bring this to a new world order, to a one world government, to kill the Christians. And they're going to, by the way, that's going to happen before the calamity of this planetary system that's coming through our solar system. That's going to happen before then. Why? Because Satan it figures it's a reset. He figures it's a global reset. Yeah. Most of humanity is going to be wiped off. So what he needs is he doesn't want to have all the interference of millions of people surviving. So he's going to go ahead and do a depopulation agenda now. He wants to be like God, worship this if he were God. So he's going to make sure they get a microchip with some 5G technology so he can be living inside. Mm -hmm. I agree. Okay. So I just say, pray, pray okay. and read your Bible and seek the Lord Jesus. Well, tell everybody how they can find out more about you, your website and all that. 